Hi and welcome to the third part of this section of videos on cancer screening tests. After learning about the validity measures of sensitivity and specificity in the last video, here we're going to talk about how these two things relate to each other. If you're not familiar with the term sensitivity and specificity, please have a watch of the last video as what we're talking about here leads directly on from that. The first thing to say is that most tests we use don't simply produce a positive or a negative result. What we usually get is a result somewhere along a continuous scale. For instance, this might be the concentration of a hormone, like PSA, in a blood sample. Unfortunately, the point at which a test result value becomes positive is something that we have to decide. What we decide this cutoff is going to be is going to have an impact in terms of the sensitivity and specificity of the test. Now we can look at this on a graph. What you can see here on the x-axis along the bottom is the value from the test result, plotted on the y-axis, the vertical axis, against the number of people with that result. The curves represent two different groups, the blue being the results people without the disease got, and the red being the results that the people with the disease got. Like everything in biology, there's a degree of variation, but when we plot large numbers of results on a graph, like this, we see that groups tend to distribute around a mean value. In this example, the blue bell-shaped curve shows us that people without the disease will get a result of somewhere between 0 and 50, with the majority of them getting a result around 25. And the red curve shows that, that people with the disease will get a result somewhere between 50 and 100, with the majority getting a result of around 75. Now, the graph as we see it would be the representation of a perfect test. If we set our cutoff value here at 50, 100% of people without the disease will test negative with a result of under 50, and all of the people with the disease will test positive with a result of above 50. But guess what? There is no such thing as a perfect test. In real life, the graph is going to look much more like this. As we can see, there is an overlap between the two groups. This overlap represents a group of people who will have similar test results, but may or may not have the disease. In other words, the test will not be able to distinguish between these people. We can relate each area of the graph to the table we saw in the previous video. This region represents people who don't have the disease and test negative, true negatives. And this area, people who have the disease and test positive, true positives. Here we have people who have the disease and test negative, false negatives. And finally, to the right, people without the disease who test positive, false positives. If we plug in some numbers here to represent the graph that we have, we can work out the sensitivity and specificity. These both work out here to be 86%. Now, as I've said, the cutoff value is something that we have to decide on, and whether we increase it or decrease it will have an impact on both the sensitivity and specificity of the test. In this example, we might not say we're satisfied with things as they are. We might want the test to identify everyone who has the disease. In other words, we want a really sensitive test. We could achieve this by lowering the threshold of a positive test. The first thing you might notice is that we've completely eliminated false negatives. So we've achieved our aim as everyone with the disease will now get a positive result. But by moving the threshold lower to the left, we've massively increased the number of people who don't have the disease who will also test positive, known as false positives. If we want the test to be really sensitive, i.e. identify a really high proportion of people who have the disease, this will usually mean lowering the threshold of a positive test. However, by doing this, you'll also get more people without the disease also getting a positive result. In other words, the test will become less specific. On the other hand, we could say that we want a test that minimises the number of people who are wrongly given a positive result and have to go on for further testing. This would be a highly specific test. We could do this by moving the threshold higher, to the right on the graph. You can see here that we've eliminated false positives by doing this, 
and increase true negatives. This means that the test will not send so many people without the disease to go on for further testing. However, we now have a far higher proportion of false negatives. In other words, by increasing the specificity, we're going to lose sensitivity and therefore miss more people who have the disease. The problem we see in the relationship between sensitivity and specificity, whereby as one increases, the other dis decreases, is known as the sensitivity-specificity trade-off. Just to try and convince you that this is what happens in real life, here is an example of what happens with a PSA test as the threshold for a positive test is increased. This table shows that as the PSA cutoff increases, the test becomes more specific, but less sensitive. We have to come up with a compromise as to where we set the value, but this isn't as simple as finding some sort of middle ground between the two. Where we choose the cutoff often depends on the specifics of the disease in question and the testing methods. If the consequences of the disease are really severe, it might be argued that increasing the sensitivity might be worthwhile if catching it early gives a real chance of cure, despite the fact that we may lose specificity and pick up more false positives as a result. It might also be more acceptable if those people who tested positive went on to have diagnostic tests that didn't have a particularly high risk of side effects. An example of this might be to say that if someone had a positive test that led to a skin biopsy, for instance, to evaluate whether they had cancer, this might be more acceptable than if they had to go on to have a lung biopsy, which might have a higher risk of side effects. Setting the value the other way would protect more patients who don't have the disease from getting unnecessary invasive testing. However, you'd miss more cases of people who actually did have the disease. So each test has to be judged on its individual merits. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please do click the like button and subscribe to the channel for more videos. In the next video, I'll be talking about what are known as process measures and in particular predictive values and what they tell us about how a screening program is working.